Hello, hello. Welcome to Courage Becomes Her, where we connect and share real life stories. I'll talk with women whom I love and I'm inspired by. Women who are experiencing life just like you and me. I'm excited for us to gather together and cultivate confidence, courage, and joy in life and work. The rule of thumb is sex will never make a relationship. It's reflective of a relationship. So if you have a healthy relationship outside the bedroom, you're likely to have a healthy relationship in the bedroom. So working outside the bedroom is a good way to enhance. Keep your hands and bodies close to each other. Hugs, hats, and kisses, and those kinds of things all fuel the sexual contact that might occur later. That was Dr. Bev Weens. Dr. Bev has been teaching psychology and counseling related subjects at Northern California colleges and universities for over 50 years. And yes, she was one of my college professors nearly 30 years ago. And today's conversation is filled with her passion about helping our relationships to be richer and more loving and helping us to be better communicators who express gratitude to one another. And gosh, some of the things that I learned from her 30 years ago have stuck with me for that long. And that's why I asked her to join us for today's conversation for Courage Becomes Her. So in today's episode and in this conversation, she talks about sexual intimacy in midlife. She shares that a satisfying sexual relationship is the result of a satisfying relationship outside of the bedroom. She educates us on the different types of sex drives and how our drives impact our sexual intimacy. She talks about the impact of perimenopause and menopause on our sexual intimacy and how our aging bodies can and do limit our sexual enjoyment. She shares from her own personal experience about the impact that physical pain and disability have on sexual intimacy. And she talks about the difficulty of enjoying sexual intimacy when we don't feel comfortable with our bodies and don't have the physical energy to participate in sexual intimacy. So I am just so grateful for her to share her expertise and her personal experience with us in today's episode. So grateful that you're here and so glad to dive into this conversation with Dr. Bev. Dr. Bev, thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation for Courage Becomes Her. How fun to reconnect and to be able to have you share with the community today. I appreciate it so very, very much. Well, great. It's fun to be here. I haven't seen you for years. (laughs) Yeah, decades, a long time. Really, really enjoy connecting with you again and hearing about all that you're doing. It's fun. Thank you. I appreciate that so much. So we're in this series for Courage Becomes Her about midlife and middle age. And in just a moment, you and I are going to talk specifically about sexual intimacy and just what human sexuality for women in midlife. Uh, But before we dive into those topics, I'd love for our community to get to know you just a little bit. So where is home and just tell a little bit about kind of home for you. Home is Rockland, California. So we've been here uh, since 2004. I can hardly believe we've been here that long. Uh, Native San Joseans. So here we are, many people migrating to this area came uh, so I could keep teaching at William, what is now William Jessup University. Yeah, so good. Oh, so good. So good. Yeah. And so you and I go back to those San Jose days back in, in the, the mid to late nineties. So incredible. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I know we're uh, going to talk a lot about what I think is your obsession today. So tell us a little bit about what is your current obsession? 
Well, it, it's just, I never in a million years when I started my career thought I would end up in this place uh, as somebody who is supposedly <laughs> Uh, an expert on sexuality. I just have been teaching this class for years and years at, at William Jessup, at Western Seminary of Rockland, San Jose, and also Portland. And I guess there's just not too many people around that like to teach this class. So I absolutely love to teach this class because a lot of people don't realize the theology of sexuality, which I know is not necessarily our topic today, but the theology of sexuality is just so profound and beautiful to me yeah. that I kind of see it through that lens. Everything I think about, I look at the parallels between our relationship with Christ and our relationship mm. with our husbands. So that just fascinates me. I love that. I love that so much. So good. It's a wonderful obsession, in my opinion. <laughs> okay, kind of the other side of the coin for a moment. What's the best movie or show that you've seen in the last year-ish? Oh, The Chosen for absolutely positive. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you've seen it. I still haven't seen it yet, but I do. I have had at least one other guest say that it was hers, and I've had multiple clients say the same. So I really need to put it on the list. You have to put it on the list and put it at the top. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Good it's, to know. It's amazing. Really, I, I think about it a lot and uh, just the parallels of watching Jesus in those years mm. of him ministering to people. So they did a great job. Oh, good. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you for setting that idea in my head again. I appreciate it. So, Okay. How about a book that has transformed your life? Francis Roberts. And we're talking about an old book here now. Come Away, My Beloved. Huh. Just wonderful, devotional, intimate talks from Jesus to us. And so I developed my my romantic relationship with Jesus based on that book. Wow. I, I'm familiar with the title, but I've never read that. So I'm going to have to look that up. Yeah. Just excellent. Excellent. Wonderful. Good. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with us and forgetting, letting the Courage Becomes Her community get to know you a little bit. I appreciate oh. that very much, very much. Okay, so this topic of sexuality, particularly as it pertains to midlife, because the majority of the Courage Becomes Her community are kind of in that, that stage. So I think one of the things that kind of has struck me about sexual intimacy in midlife is that anecdotally it's kind of talked about as being like maybe the most satisfying season um, for sexual intimacy. And I think that there are components of that that seem like they're true, like we're more comfortable with who we are. We're no longer worried about, you know, making an impression, quote unquote, um, those sorts of things. So I'd love to kind of just talk about that like is that true or is that a misnomer because there are other things that kind of feed into that may that maybe seem like they're the opposite of that you know that we're going through so many changes in our bodies and you know etc cetera, etc cetera, that might make it a more difficult and less satisfying season so maybe just start there of like from your experience like what what does this season of life look like one of the things that I think is really important is uh, a disclaimer at this point, because everybody has a different journey. Mm -hmm. um, for some women, the early childhood years are very exhausting because you're on duty 24-7. You know, always, always. And when you go on vacation, you take your work with you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. little, uh, my husband and I went out for my birthday just Monday night, and we were entertained constantly by this poor mom and dad that were trying to have dinner together with their little ones. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember those days so well. You know, you mm. just, there's no 
time to let down and relax. You're just always, and they were great parents. It was just, uh, it's just just Mm -hmm. comical to remind us of those days when children were little. And so women are often too tired for sexual intimacy. Uh, They enjoy the cuddling, they enjoy the loving, but, you know, don't ask me to get up the energy for an orgasm because I just Mm -hmm. have that much energy, you know? Yeah. Of course, that becomes, can become a real issue in a couple's relationship. If Mm. he doesn't have an orgasm for some men, that is a sign of success, you know, and that they feel they haven't somehow, you know, she's not responsive enough. Mm. So some people struggle with that in the early years, and then they kind of come alive in the 40s and 50s because, Mm -hmm. you know, Children have driver's licenses and they're, you know, not the cab driver anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just they're not with them every minute of every day. And so yeah. they have more energy. The other part of that reality, though, is that um, there's the menopause issue. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. hormones going down, mm-hmm. uh, estrogen levels declining. Uh, hot flashes, you know, yeah. things like that, just drain of energy. So, mm-hmm. and oftentimes intercourse becomes more painful mm-hmm. because vaginal tissues are shrinking. They're yeah. becoming thinner and thinner and they can actually tear. Mm-hmm. So, you know, they, they they become very fragile. So there can be pain going on at intercourse that you have to kind of deal with that too by the way i would recommend lubrication it's usually the the tissues at the very mouth of the vagina that tend to shrink more and there's a lubricant any lubricant will be helpful but there's a lubricant called replens r-e-p-l-e-n-s okay and um that one is actually restorative of the tissues. Hmm. Plumps up and allows the tissues to hold moisture better. Wow. So that one is used not just when you're going to have intercourse, but it's used regularly hmm. to actually help lubricate the tissues. There's also estrogen creams. Those are the kinds of things I think that can be really helpful in midlife if you're hmm. starting to experience the hormone uh, levels decreasing and yeah. therefore the vaginal area not being as healthy as it was before, you know, yeah. to steamed intercourse. That's good. Those might be some suggestions. Yeah. I appreciate that. Super yeah. helpful. Talk just a little bit about maybe from a more general perspective, like what are some of the things that for sexual intimacy, just period, regardless of, you know, ages and stages of life that can help us to have a more satisfying sexual experience? Well, the rule of thumb is sex will never make a relationship. Mm -hmm. It's reflective of a relationship. Mm -hmm. So if you have a healthy relationship outside the bedroom, you're likely to have a healthy relationship in the bedroom. So Mm. working outside the bedroom is a good way to enhance. Now, I'm not talking about sexual dysfunctions that have a biological component to them. That's like a topic issue, which we can get into. But uh, I'm just talking about relationship satisfaction. Mm. And you know, another phrase that I've heard people say is couples who play together stay together, you mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. And another phrase I've heard is, you know, sex begins in the kitchen. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Keep your hands and bodies close to each other. Hugs, mm. and pats and kisses and those kinds of things all fuel mm. the sexual contact that might incur late, you know, occur later. Yeah. The other thing to be aware of that I've found in in many couples is the issue of different types of sex drive. Some people have expressive sex drive, and some people have receptive sex drive. Hmm. 
And of course, the stereotype is that men are the ones with the expressive sex drive. In other words, they get turned on before they have sex. They are the initiators, okay? Yeah. And that women are receptive. And of course, biologically, this is true. You know, women mm. are, but a receptive sex drive is one who isn't necessarily turned on or thinking about sex until they're actually doing it. Mm -hmm. And then they come alive. Yeah. So one type is you're alive before you even start. The other, you know, is that you're not alive until you do start. That doesn't mean that both partners aren't incredible sexual people and mm. can enjoy each other. But if you don't understand the two different types of drive, you know, so for example, it's not uncommon for men to say she never initiates sex. Yeah. Well, that's because she must have receptive sex drive. You're mm. supposed to engage her and get her turned on. <laughs> and then she functions really well, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, where, uh, but the truth of the matter is men can have receptive sex drive too. Yeah. And sometimes women don't understand why he never initiates. And she mm. always has to be the one to make the first move, you know? Yeah. And so you get a couple together where one has expressive and one has receptive. If we understand that, it works mm -hmm. fine, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. If we're willing to do what is needed for our partner yeah. to engage. If you get two receptive people together, that's a little bit more difficult. Do you see yes. that? <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. So, Scripture talks about iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. So what we have to do, hopefully, one of the reasons God puts two people together that are opposites is because we learn from each other mm -hmm. how to develop, receptive learns how to develop initiation. Initiators learn how to woo their partners. Mm -hmm. And so both people learn better. And you have, you, you know, from each other. Yeah. And you have what I call is a beautiful dance of intimacy mm -hmm. where both mm -hmm. partners can be the pursuer and both partners can be the distancer. Mm -hmm. The text is about coming together and coming apart. And so if you don't have people that are doing this dance well, you've got to chase. You don't mm -hmm. have actual intimacy. Yeah. I was doing a Bible study one time, and one of the people in the study, I, I don't know how we got into this topic, but she gets up and she starts running around my dining room table. And she says, this is how my husband is. He chases me all over the place. Make love with me. Make love with me. Make love with me. And then suddenly I stop and I turn and I say, ah, talk to me, talk to me. <laughs> And then he runs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what turns women on is talk. Yeah. Men learn that. It's yeah. amazing, you know. Mm. But otherwise, we have a chase. One partner chasing the other, one partner running away. Yeah. So we need mm. to learn to do this dance. Mm. And so if we don't have that dance in place, Midlife is a good place to start this for sure. Yeah. You understand the need of our partner and to recognize them as one type or the other type generally mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and learn how to respond to that opposite type mm. that uh, you might not have understood in the first place. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Super helpful. Thank you. I appreciate that. Stay together. Stay together. Let sex start in the kitchen. <laughs> Those are good. Yeah, I love how you say of just keep your bodies close. Like that. I really appreciate that one for sure. That's yeah. what feels uh effective functioning in the bedroom. So then the bedroom reflects the health of the relationship outside. Hmm. Many people try to expect that sex will keep them together. And usually uh, it doesn't. In fact, this is another little hint. You can tell about the health of the relationship by how you feel in the resolution phase. 
Mm-hmm. Because some people use sex to try to feel intimate, but in the re- in the resolution phase, so they'll feel intimate while they're engaged, mm-hmm. but in the resolution phase, a feeling of loneliness will come over them, mm-hmm. or a feeling of lack of satisfaction will come mm-hmm. over them. And often people interpret that feeling as something's wrong with their sex drive or life, Mm. or they need to do more, or they need, you know, whatever. So if a feeling of dissatisfaction happens after engaging in sex, Mm -hmm. it usually relates to a non-sexual need that you're trying to get met with sex. Wow. So if a non-sexual, in other words, I feel lonely. I feel disconnected from you Hmm. in general. And we have sex and it goes away just for an instant Hmm. and comes back. Yeah. Wow. I'm bored with my life. You know, if boredom is the reason you're having sex, (laughs) Hmm. then boredom will be right back. Your new, your old friend. Yeah. Right here again, you know? Hmm. So, if you're having sex to get rid of anger, for example, a lot of d- domestic violence relationships are, you know, sex is used as a catharsis. Mm. Well, guess what? You'll feel rid of your anger, but only for a moment. Mm. And then it will come back because you, sex cannot meet a non-sexual need. Mm. It can only meet a sexual need. Yeah. And so non-sexual need, that's the reality of your relationship, is going to remind you of its presence, yeah. the wow. resolution face, and it's something that sex won't fix. Yeah, that makes yeah. so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So there's some general things about relationship health that I think uh, can be very, very beneficial if you understand. So absolutely. Uh, suggestion for that one. Hidden bedroom partners, needs and motives that destroy sexual intimacy. Hmm. And it goes through the book goes through a lot of hidden needs that we have that are not sexual hmm. that we often try to meet with sex. Okay. And it'll never do it, you know. Mm-hmm. No, it's good. Yeah. Let's um I want let's dive in a little bit more. You brought up, you know, kind of menopause, perimenopause, and it talked with about a couple of aspects of that. So let's talk a little bit more specifically about that in particular and kind of what that does to our drive, to our bodies. You talk you mentioned, you know, lower energy, um, the actual thinning of our actual anatomy. Yeah. Um, so what else in your experience and, um, you know, are things that we should, should be aware of? Well, I think the hot flashes themselves are, are quite a deterrent. I'll talk about my own experience. <laughs> um, I started menopause at 38. The first yeah. thing I noticed was weight gain. Mm-hmm. And then by early 40s, I was well into the hot flashes. I was having numerous flashes a day. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I'm a teacher. So I'm standing mm-hmm. up teaching. And all of a sudden, my glasses fog up, you know, and I'm trying to look cool as a cucumber, <laughs> and not upset at all. So but I can't see my lecture notes. <laughs> I'm the glasses off just as calmly as I possibly can. I wipe them on my blouse, you know, and then I try to put them back on and quickly look at my notes because they're going to fog up again. Fog up again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. So it was crazy. Yeah. Uh, just crazy. And I was trying so hard not to look flashed, you know. Mm-hmm. There I was. So I went to the doctor, and, and he said my FSH levels were twice as high as he would diagnose menopause. Wow. <laughs> so it oh was my gosh. Double over that. And yeah. so I went on hormones right away and 
that kind of took care of that. So, but yeah, wow. they can be very disruptive to your life, not just to your profession, but to your bedroom. Yeah. Because they tend to happen a lot at night, you know. Mm-hmm. That's why yeah. women complain about the hot flashes and just all of a sudden drains of energy and sweat all yeah. over. Who wants mm-hmm. to make up when you're going through all of that? Yeah. So, for sure. I appreciate too that you bring up the weight gain because I think like yeah. that definitely can add to the lack of interest, you know, a lack of drive because you're not feeling good about yourself because, you know, you're uncomfortable in your own body. So yes. I don't maybe talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Self esteem issues are a big part of, of the bedroom. Because if you're not feeling good about your body mm-hmm. and yourself, it is very hard to let someone love you. It mm-hmm. is very hard to hear someone say, you really turn me on. Mm-hmm. Very hard to hear someone say, I love you so much. Because you have an immediate negative reaction to that usually. Mm-hmm. And that immediate negative, instead of being able to be receptive and receive those affirmations, Mm. it is, is, you know, cognitive, in psych, we call it cognitive dissonance, you know? Yeah. Yeah. When when my mind says one thing about myself and then you say another, Mm -hmm. I'm going to kick it out really quick because I can't stand the cognitive dissonance. Yeah. And to allow it to come in to the point that it actually heals body image mm. and you develop a better perspective about yourself. Mm. It's hard to let that feedback come in. Mm-hmm. Mm. And so being aware of the cognitive dissonance yeah. and your willingness to kick it out immediately instead of receiving mm-hmm. someone's love, someone's affirmation. Uh, they don't even have to say anything, but the fact that you're turning them on and they're enjoying this experience with you, you have to stay in that receptive mode of receiving that I am, I'm an adequate sexual partner. Hmm. Just what my husband needs. Hmm. He needs me and me alone. I can satisfy him. You know, those kinds of self-talks going on in your yeah. head. Instead yeah. of, oh, I wonder if he's feeling that bulge. Mm-hmm. He, you know, I'm, you know, those kind of things will undermine the ability to get to an orgasm big time. Mm-hmm. So, again, working outside the bedroom to heal self esteem. Mm-hmm. There, you know, if you go to sex therapy, there are some exercises people can do that help to deal with self-esteem issues. Yeah. And so uh, exercises in the bedroom as well as outside the bedroom that had helped couples to work through those self-esteem issues. That's, yeah, really good, really good. And I think, I mean, I know it seems a little bit cliche to say, but so many husbands, at least kind of in interviews and whatnot, would say, like, they don't notice. They're not you know, the, where we feel, you know, the roll in our tummy or the, you know, uncomfortable, you know, back chunk that might be there or whatever, like that they're just not noticing. So I I do really appreciate that it is something that we can work on ourselves, but it also listening to that, you know, positive affirmation, you know, from our partner is good as well. So, yeah, you know, I told my husband the other day, you know, I have an average American middle-aged, elderly-aged body shape. That's just (laughs) what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it is normal. (laughs) It's so normal. Yeah, you know that, hey, there's a little bit extra around the waist. Mm -hmm. And that's just life, you know? Yes, yeah, that's good. 
Okay, just interrupting the conversation with Dr. Bev super quickly. If the popularity of shows like Outlander and Bridgerton tell us anything about our culture, it's that few among us wouldn't welcome a more enjoyable sexual intimacy and sexual relationship. So please think of the friend in your life who you've had a conversation or two with about sex and please share today's episode with her. And if you haven't already done so, will you also please leave a five-star rating and a review on whatever podcast app or player that you're using? I would so very much appreciate you doing that for Courage Becomes Her. All right, let's get back to the conversation with Dr. Bev. You brought up energy. Talk a little bit about a little more about energy, um, because I know you have uh, some thoughts around that that I know are really helpful in in this category. Yeah, yeah. Well, preparing yourself for sex is a great deal of what you do outside the bedroom. And that is, you know, watching what you eat, too Mm -hmm. much sugar, too much salt, too many desserts, uh, whatever. It's not just a matter of weight. It's a matter of energy. Yeah. And so your energy tends to crash when you have too much sugar. Mm -hmm. One of the bad habits that that I have that I've had since I was (laughs) old enough to eat dessert, I mean, little, little infancy almost, is that my mom always serve dessert right before bedtime. Mm. And so I have continued that terrible tradition. And to me, I have to have dessert right before I go to bed. You know, Mm. it's the way it is. It may not affect that bedroom time, but it will affect the next one. You know, I'm not as healthy if I'm not eating in a healthy way. Yeah. So, you know, exercise, good nutrition, take your vitamins, you know, Mm. care for yourself, you know, Mm. caring for ourselves, like getting our hair done, uh, having our nails done, you know, those are things that that tell me I'm valuable. I'm worth spending Mm. a lot of time and energy on myself. Yeah. Our clothing, for example, that's not just for our husbands, it's for ourselves. So those things are pick-me-ups, yeah. you know, and everybody has other things that they do for pick-me-ups. But um, again, keeping yourself healthy so that you have the energy for a sexual relationship mm-hmm. is really important. One of the other things, though, that is a reality is that starting about 40, our husband's sexual energy will probably begin declining. Mm. So him staying healthy too is another part of this dance that we're supposed to do together. Yeah. Yeah. But but his testosterone levels are going to be going down about 0.4% per year. Mm-hmm. So testosterone is the thing that fuels sex drive. And so you can expect that there's going to be some decline there, not Mm -hmm. taking it personally, you know, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but just realizing that that might be happening for him. Testosterone uh, replacement might be advised, Mm -hmm. may or may not, you know, just depends. But starting about age 40, men probably will every once in a while after eating too much or drinking too much, may have an episode where they uh, aren't able to climax. Mm -hmm. And then what happens, because performance for a man is so much related to his masculine identity, and he'll start coming to every sexual encounter wondering if he's going to be able to function. Mm -hmm. And the minute you do that, that's called spectatoring. (laughs) You know, I'm out of your body. And you, you are observing, how am I doing? Is it going to work? And, you know, and so you begin being anxious mm. and that, of course, undermines performance. Yeah. So y- you've got maybe hormonal issues going on and he does too. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm. That's important to realize. One of the things that can happen though, um, because 
performing is so related to self-esteem for men is that sometimes if they're starting to not be able to perform well or they're unsure of themselves, they'll they'll kind of pick a fight before bedtime Mm. so that they've got an excuse not to have sex. Yeah, interesting. Makes it, you know, obvious that he's not functioning well. Yeah. So tension and fighting and struggling can happen there just to avoid Mm -hmm. the wife knowing that he's starting to have some erectile problems. Okay. Wow. So just be aware that that can be happening, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, really good to be aware of. Yeah. Going to the doctor is just not what they want to do. Mm-hmm. I'm aware mm-hmm. that. Yeah. <laughs> Mm, no, that's good. Good to be aware of, especially not for that kind of problem. <laughs> yes, yes. So, and while we're on the topic, kind of of the functioning of our bodies, I do. I remember you telling the story of how back pain impacted uh, you, you and your husband's sexual intimacy, and I. I think. I mean, you must have been early, early midlife years about then early 40s. So I I think that seems like just the general aging of our bodies and the changes that take place for us and, you know, even into extreme disability. Like that is something that we don't really seem to talk much about and to really pay attention to of like muscles that are atrophying or just aging or, you know, our bodies aren't as limber as they once were and, you know, all of those sorts of things. So kind of how I'm curious to know, like how you navigated that season and it just the, you know, the aging of your bodies and, you know, maybe not being able to do the things that you once were able to do because of physical pain or discomfort, etc. Yeah. Well, when you say that season, I would say that season is continuing to be this season. The rest of life. Yes. <laughs> lives, you know, uh, Yeah, so I have some good news for all of you guys that are listening. And that good news is we're all in the process of aging. Mm. Isn't that good news? Yeah, Mm -hmm. (laughs) or at least not alone, in it alone. (laughs) No, No, uh, it's just a reality. Mm. Uh, I often think when couples take that vow, you know, uh, or better or worse in sickness and in health and all of those things, you don't really realize what you're promising yeah. because life can deal you some ugly turns. So we had some ugly turns mm. and uh, my husband has metal cages up his back and he has had 10 surgeries now, all related to one fight that he had with a man on PCP. Mm. He was a cop. Mm. And so the man was raping women, and my husband didn't want to shoot him. Mm. So he came on physically. Mm. So he's still in pain Mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. We have now found a doctor who is, we consider, a brave man and a good man who is willing to give him some pain medications. Mm. Otherwise, he has lived in agony for many years, Mm. over 30 years now. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Yeah, so yes, pain is one thing that takes all of your attention. Mm -hmm. It doesn't allow you to set it aside and focus on anything else. Mm -hmm. It will undermine everything. Yeah. So it's been a great loss in our lives, Mm. the ability to function. And if you take pain Mm. medications, then the pain medications affect the ability. Mm -hmm. So this is just one of the things that is part of our lives Mm. and has been for many years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how, I mean, there are many people that are experiencing that to one degree or another. So when it comes to our sexual intimacy, when we do have a situation like that, like, what do we do? Well, 
there's, you know, and this is something that people don't talk about very much, but uh, you, you get through it the best you can. Mm-hmm. You know, you you try to keep the intimacy levels high outside the bedroom. Mm-hmm. With hugs and kisses and, you know, I'm sorry you're hurting and can mm-hmm. I get you anything? And, you know, those those affirmations of care, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know. We're called to illustrate the kinds of love that God has for us. Mm. And storge love is Mm. care love. You know, I will care for you when you're sick. I will care for you when, you know, you're hurting. And Mm. so I've had to express a fair amount of storge love Mm. in a relationship. So erotic love, eros, storge, you know, erotic love is not the only kind of love there is. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so that's the kind of love that is more prominent in our relationship now. Yeah, yeah. Now there are uh, there are places that deal with disability equipment mm-hmm. that allow you to keep functioning sexually. And a lot of people feel kind of squeamish about it, but... You know, there are dildos if your husband doesn't have, is not having a uh, an ability to have an erection. Mm-hmm. Maybe you want to buy some equipment to be able mm-hmm. to do that. There are vibrators. There are right. different kinds of equipment that you can use to help achieve what you used to help, you know, achieve naturally. Mm-hmm. Many people are very resistant to that. But... Mm-hmm. You know, we know a couple who's, I mean, he's paraplegic. Mm -hmm. And so they have to use equipment in order to be able to function together sexually. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's good. It's helpful insight to be able to, you know, not limit our thinking or, you know, the ways that we can be together. To not see it in a perverted way. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, Yeah. there's plenty of perversion around in our culture. (laughs) But uh, I really believe, you know, the medical profession deals with the medical issues, but often neglects the relational issues that come Mm. with back surgeries and paraplegia. Any disability can can really be very disruptive. Yeah, yeah. In such a relationship. Mm. Yeah. What else have we not yet talked about that, you know, can just help us in this place of, you know, satisfying sexual intimacy in midlife and as we do continue to age? I think one of the things that has sustained me in the relationship is my marriage vows. I said, you know, for better or worse. Yeah. In sickness or in health. Mm-hmm. So long as we both shall live, mm-hmm. I do, you know. Yeah. yeah. So the aging process, you've probably heard people say aging is not for sissies. Well, I'm there now, you know, mm. and uh, I totally agree. Yeah. And it just takes determination to mm. get up and be pleasant and take the aspirin if you need it to deal with mm. the pain of all these achy muscles. <laughs> yes. I guess. And continue to cherish each other and be thankful for each other, you know. Oh my goodness. I'm really surprised my husband is alive. Mm-hmm. Been through so much. Yeah. And many of his former colleagues have died already and they haven't gone through mm. anything like what he's gone through, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I'm amazed and and thankful that he's here, that he continues to go on, mm. and that he's such a good friend. Mm. And so the kind of love that you have in the later years might not be quite as uh, explosive as it was. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, in many ways, more satisfying. Mm. It's yeah. calmer. It's deeper. 
Mm. There's a lot of ways to make love. Yes, yeah. Penile vaginal insertion isn't the only way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, and so as our abilities diminish, we have to just accommodate to it, whatever that is. Good communication between the two of you. Mm. Instead of running away, picking fights, hiding, you know. That's good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Well, you are most certainly inspiring courage in me as I just reconnect with you and and am reminded of some of your own personal story and and just uh, sharing with us. So I do always close with a final question with our guests of who or what is inspiring courage in you right now. Mm-hmm. I think scripture, particularly revelations. Hmm. I am so looking forward to heaven. Mm. <laughs> Isn't mm. that fun? You know, you think I would be. <laughs> no, yeah. But you know, all these aches and pains that I have. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> mm. I'm, I'm looking forward to being free of that. Mm. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking forward to seeing people I haven't seen for a, a while, mm. you know. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking forward to whatever job I'm going to have in heaven. <laughs> yes. Because I'm the bride of Christ. And so I get to do things that will enhance him and his reputation. And I don't mm. know what that will be, but I'll be happy to do it. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. Yeah. That is, yeah. That's definitely something to look forward to. Yeah. Now, I'm not looking forward to death. Mm. As as one person who was in the process of dying said, I know where I'm going, but the transportation is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. I don't look forward to be. the transportation, <laughs> mm. but I do look forward to getting there. Mm, so good. Yes. Me too. Yeah. Mm. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm just incredibly grateful to have had the opportunity. You're welcome. It was kind of fun. It was. It was. Thank you. I so very much appreciate how Dr. Bev talked to us about taking care of our bodies, but not necessarily for the benefit of the outward or the appearances sake, but for the benefit of having more energy. Gosh, that just makes so much sense. And I know that I have personally experienced that at times in my life and how having more energy, as Dr. Bev said, can allow us to have a more satisfying sexual relationship. So I just love being able to look at that benefit of energy as being a motivator rather than thinking about, you know, the physical appearance and and those elements, which can be good as well, but can also, as we know, tend to have more of a shaming effect to them. So energy, energy is what we are after. So Uh, I also just love how Dr. Bev's conversation reminded us that self-care isn't selfish. Rhonda talked about that in episode 54 on September 19th, and it just is such a good reminder and good conversation for us to be having of what are the benefits of self-care that are going just beyond the pampering experience. So I love those two takeaways from this conversation with Dr. Bev. And isn't she just lovely? I'm so grateful that I had the opportunity to have her join me and that she was willing to do so and uh, just brought such a a good, healthy conversation uh, to us in this topic of sexual intimacy. So uh, if you want to connect with her, her email is actually in the show notes. She welcomes that. And the books that we talked about are also in the show notes, as well as the uh, lubricant that she shared. So feel free to take a look at those. And next week, we're going to take a pause on the midlife topic. And I'm going to bring you a surprise topic and a surprise uh, conversation next week. And then 
we will pick up with the midlife series the following week. So please join me for next week's special surprise uh, episode. All right, take care. What an honor to help you to cultivate confidence, courage, and joy in your life and work. Thank you so much for inviting me to journey with you. I look forward to being back with you next week where we'll hear another story from a woman whom I love and am inspired by and look forward to learning from. Thank you.